I am amazing at writing CSS, especially if I'm working alone on a project and I don't have to maintain or update my styling rules later. When change requests or maintenance come into play, well, things tend to get a little bit awkward. In the front-end world, a lot of times, CSS is considered an afterthought. To some extent, this is understandable due to the sheer number of things you have to juggle while developing web apps. However, there are a lot of tools aimed to improve the CSS development experience and, with a little bit of effort, your results could improve substantially. In this video, I'm going to finally give Tailwind CSS a real shot and, hopefully, we'll find out if all the buzz around it is legitimate or not. I had my eye on Tailwind for quite a while now, but I never did more than scratch the surface. At the first glance, I'm not gonna lie, it looked like a terrible tool only a crazy person would use. To their credit, this first impression is acknowledged in the Tailwind documentation, so, even if it looks bad, maybe there is more to it. After all, in all my development years, I ran into a lot of issues with my CSS, regardless of the approach I used. Plain CSS is great, but it doesn't really enforce an architecture, so things can get messy really quickly. Object-oriented CSS feels natural to me, but I'm usually ending up running away from anything that has object-oriented in its name. Block element modifiers naming conventions can easily get out of hand, and so on and so forth. Knowing these pitfalls, I agree there must be a better way to do this, and here is where Tailwind CSS is coming in. In short, these are its main selling points. First of all, no more headaches with coming up with appropriate class names. I fully agree with this one. Most of the time, I'm starting with a clear list of rules to follow when naming things. But one year into the project, when the third version of the specs come in, I usually end up using weird stuff such as new hero button which becomes over specific and not reusable at all. Second of all, your CSS stops growing. Using a traditional approach, your CSS files get bigger every time you add a new feature. With utilities, everything is reusable, so you rarely need to write new CSS. Again, I fully agree with this one. I rarely spend time trimming down my CSS files. Usually, I'm just piling styling rules on top of other styling rules and then move forward to the next thing I have to build. Last but not least, making changes feel safer. CSS is global and you never know what you're breaking when you make changes. Classes in your HTML are local, so you can change them without worrying about something else breaking. I am at fault here as well. In large codebases, if I need something done quickly, and that's usually the case in real projects running on production, I prefer to just create a new specific class, write my CSS rules, and avoid reusing, changing existing styles because of possible regressions. Ok, so on paper, these selling points make a lot of sense. Let's spend the next few minutes installing Tailwind, building a basic UI component to get a sense of the dev experience, and, based on the results, figure out if it's a tool worth learning and using. There is an easy way to install and use Tailwind as standalone, but in this video we'll add it into a Vite project where we are using React as the UI library. Vite is pretty popular these days and React needs no introduction, so I believe this should reflect a common project you are likely to work in. Tailwind works by scanning all your HTML files, JavaScript components and any other templates for class names, generating the corresponding styles and then writing them to a static CSS file. In Vite, we can add Tailwind as a post CSS plugin and we'll end up with two new configuration files in our project. One for post CSS and the second one for Tailwind. In a minute, we'll make some changes in here. In the app.tsx file, let's add a basic HTML structure for the main content and the page header. Of course, the header can be defined in its own file as a React component, but I'm just focusing on using Tailwind here, so don't worry too much about other details. In the header, I define the logo and the basic navigation. Ok, so Tailwind promises we don't have to write any CSS, so I will aim for that. I want to add a light grey background to our header. There are a wide range of background utility classes, all starting with BG- we could use one of the predefined BG gray options, or use square brackets to define a custom hex color. Inside the header, let's add a container, which auto aligns to center, uses flex display, and has some top and bottom padding. Ok, so these seem like a bunch of random classes, and this is one of the main issues I have with the framework. The large amount of utility classes you need to know is overwhelming at first. 
I get the feeling that you are looking at a steep learning curve and then your project will be locked in into this system for its entire lifespan. In Tailwind's defense, the utility classes are fairly intuitive if you are familiar with CSS and the framework enforces a coherent architecture in your project. At the end of the day, you are looking at a list of pros and cons and if the trade-off makes sense to you, the utility classes approach should not be a deal breaker. Back to the code, let's look at the four classes. Containers are components for fixing an element width to the current breakpoint. Tailwind is built with responsive design in mind and this is the list of breakpoints baked into the framework. The mx-auto rule translates to set margin on the x-axis to auto. The way utility classes are composed should be clear now. We could add some left hand side margin using the margin left dash 2 class or a general margin using the margin dash 4 class. What are the two and four values here? These are part of the spacing scale used by Tailwind to unify dimensions used in the project. Here you'll find the list of the default values. In a second, you'll see that these values, just like a lot of other rules inside Tailwind, can be easily overwritten in the config file. The third class will make our container use Flexbox and hopefully the padding rule should be easily understandable now that we've looked at margin rules as well. Okay, next let's style our navigation links. Link elements have inline display by default so let's make them inline block and then add some padding on the Y and X axis. I'll make the font bold and finally we'll underline the text whenever the user is hovering the element. Using the column we can add styles to various states like the hover or the active state and even target pseudo elements such as first, last or placeholder. Since we have three links, we are forced to duplicate these classes and obviously this is not that great. Granted, in most use cases, we could use a templating language and some sort of for construct to simplify this code. In React, JSX allows you to do this easily, but we'll need to store our link in a JavaScript list. However, if for whatever reason templating is not possible, we can use the layer directive to easily reuse our code. Let's jump into the index.css file, which is included in our app header, and add a component directive in here. Next, let's define a custom class name and, using the apply, declare the list of utility classes for our nav link element. Jumping back to the header, we can now refactor our code and use a single class name to apply all the necessary CSS rules. While we are here, let's get back to the index.css file for a second. These three directives probably caught your eye already. They are placeholders needed so that Tailwind knows to inject its core styles, the component classes and any of the utility styles created by the framework or any other plugin you might be using. Yes, I mentioned plugins. One very appealing aspect of Tailwind is its extensibility through third-party plugins. Let's take a quick detour and explore this a little bit. Tailwind's typography is a nice little plugin enabling beautiful typographic defaults for HTML. We can install this in our project using the following command and then in the Tailwind configuration file, let's register the plugin. This is pretty much it. We now have access to a pros class we can use to make content look way more beautiful. While we are at the configuration topic, there is a lot of flexibility here. Before moving forward, however, I would like to take a moment and kindly ask you to subscribe to this channel if you want to stay up to date with the dev space. Back to configuration, let's add a custom font in our project. I'll go with the Google free font here. So let's import this font in the HTML header and then in the config file under theme extend, I'm defining a font family property where the new font is registered. Remember the Oswald key here because when we get back to our Tailwind classes, we can simply add a font-oswald class and everything falls into place. Impressive, right? I would need a much longer video to go through all the features Tailwind CSS has to offer. We didn't get the chance to discuss dark mode support or responsive design for instance, so if you are seeing a lot of promising potential in the framework, be sure to spend a few minutes browsing their documentation. I for one am fairly impressed and I'm going to use the first opportunity to integrate Tailwind in a proper project. I am really curious to find out if my expectations will be met and the long term maintenance of styling will improve. Before wrapping things up, I want to give a shout out to the following two related projects. First of all, you can use the Tailwind Playground to learn how the framework works, prototype a new idea or create a demo to share online. Second of all, take a look at Tailwind UI, an impressive collection of components and templates built and maintained by the same team behind Tailwind CSS. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and help me fight the YouTube algorithm. Until next time, thank you for watching.